Merry Go Round Storytelling presents Test Valley Tales with Amanda Kane Smith. Hello, I'm Amanda. Welcome to the Test Valley Tales podcast. This podcast features the stories from my illustrated book called Test Valley Tales. Each week, I'll be telling a traditional story based in a real location in the beautiful borough of Test Valley, which, if you're not from round here, is in Hampshire, in England, in the UK. All the stories are different, but they are all magical in one way or another. So whether you're curious about strange-looking dragons or magical wish-giving fish, enchanted trees or even spooky ghost legends, I'm sure there'll be a tale here for everyone. And if you're listening locally, I hope you may want to go out and explore the place the story is set and maybe see if you can find some of the things I refer to there. I can't promise you'll meet any of the magical creatures, but if you do come across any, please say hello from me. Well, I think it's time to get on with this week's tale. So, make yourselves comfortable, and I will set the scene. This week's tale is a magical story, and it's called The Baker's Daughter of Amport. are full of magic, but there are many day-to-day wonders we can enjoy in them. Like strolling through the wildflowers in spring, or catching sunbeams as they dance through the leaves in summer. Maybe crunching the dry fallen leaves of gold and amber in the autumn, or the thrill of being the first to crack the thin glass of ice on a frozen puddle in the winter. There are three woods that I know of around Amport, and these are Lower Amport Wood, Upper Amport Wood and Great Wood. It is not possible to walk through these woods nowadays, but there are smaller woods and many great paths that can be explored around them. Sometimes, as I am walking along, I like to stop and gaze at the trees from a distance and look at all the different shades of green, like a tapestry woven beneath the sky. And sometimes, when I'm walking along the edge of a wood, I like to peep in through the dangling leaves and look at the lush beauty which can be seen inside. The moss on the fallen branches, the wild flowers stretching up to catch some of the sun among the long grasses, the shadows and secret places. Woods are full of legends and magical creatures, sought out but generally unseen by us regular folk. And I have heard that it is in one of these woods that something very curious happened a long, long time ago. Which is why, when I hear an owl hoot, I always stop and look up. On the edge of the wood, by the edge of the village, there was once a baker's shop where a baker lived with his daughter. This baker was as generous as he was round, and it was often said that he looked like one of the buns in his bakery. His daughter, on the other hand, was tall and thin, and had not inherited any of her father's kind nature. In fact, she was so mean and unkind that no one ever wanted to be served by her, which meant her father had to work twice as hard, serving customers as well as taking on the lion's share of the baking. Meanwhile, his daughter grew lazier and lazier, ruder and ruder, and nothing her father said would change her for the better. One night, When the moon looked so huge, its light spilled out across the entire black sky, 
the baker carefully locked up his shop and set off home through the woods, with his daughter following closely behind. They had not gone very far before they noticed a large pile of rags at the foot of an old oak tree ahead. A slither of the moon's rays had sneaked through the oak tree's branches and spread itself over the rags like a soft, silvery veil. The baker and his daughter were curious, so they carefully edged their way closer to get a better look. As they did, they saw it was not a pile of rags at all, but an old woman slumped by the tree. Concerned she may be in some distress, the baker went to see if he could be of any help. As he got closer, he saw the material they thought was rags was in fact a raggedy cloak which the old woman was holding tightly around her body. The baker leant over as the old woman looked up. She had round eyes the colour of amber and a long hooked nose which seemed to cover her mouth completely. But she was not frightening to look at. In fact, her eyes seemed full of strength and wisdom. Then, shifting her gaze towards his daughter, she slid out one of her hands from underneath her cloak. The baker couldn't help but notice how bony they were, and her nails were so pointy they almost looked like claws. Then, the old woman stretched one of her bony fingers towards his daughter and said, Baker's daughter, Baker's daughter, doesn't do the things she ought to. I am hungry, must be fed. Baker's daughter, bake some bread. There was a moment's silence as the baker slowly stood up. He turned to his daughter and was about to speak, but before he could, his daughter began to laugh. It was a loud, shrill laugh that cut through the silence with its malice. you are talking to me like that must be fed must you she mocked that's typical of your sort preying on the kind nature of my father well you're too late old woman the bakery is closed the baker was truly shocked by his daughter's outburst he knew she had been getting worse recently, insulting customers and being unhelpful, but insulting this frail old lady was the last straw. He decided enough was enough. Daughter, I have warned you these last few weeks that I will no longer tolerate this behaviour. I want you to take this woman back to the bakery. There is a little bit of dough left in the larder. You can use that to bake her some bread. Then he fumbled inside his overcoat and brought out his keys. He took the largest off the bunch and handed it to her. Here is the shop key. I'll go home and make a start on supper. If you refuse to do this one act of kindness, do not bother returning home tonight or ever again. It broke his heart to speak in such a way, but now, here in the woods, listening to the cruelty in her voice, he felt he had no other choice but to teach his daughter a lesson. The baker's words were so firm and assured that for once the daughter could say nothing in return. She realised she had gone too far and reluctantly took the key. She put her arm around the old woman's hunched shoulders and helped her to walk. The old woman's cloak felt odd. It was like the rags were full of small bones. It also had an unexpected softness to it that made her screw her nose up in distaste and her entire body shivered. But her father had made himself quite clear. So she hesitantly helped the old woman through the wood to the bakery. When she arrived, she unlocked the shop door and went inside. The smell they were greeted with was glorious. 
It had not been long since they had closed the shop for the day, and the bakery was still warm and the air full with the smells of spices and yeast and all the sweet things which had been used to bake the bread that day. The baker's daughter slammed the door shut and told the old woman to wait. She sauntered behind the counter and grabbed a small piece of dough. Carelessly, she rolled the dough, threw it in a tin and slammed it into the oven, which was still hot. There was a little glass window on the front of the oven through which it was possible to see how the bread was baking. As she glanced in, she was shocked to see that the bread had already risen into a fine, crusty loaf. She opened the door to look more closely. As she did, the heat rushed out, filling her senses with that wonderful fresh bread smell, and she saw the loaf was much bigger than she had expected. <laughs> this is too good for the likes of that old woman, she snarled. And even though she knew the old woman must have heard her, she lied and told the old woman she had burnt the bread and set it aside to sell the following morning. Then she told the old woman to go. But the old woman did not go. She stretched out her claw-like hand and, pointing her bony finger, said, Baker's daughter, baker's daughter, doesn't do the thing she ought to. I am hungry, must be fed. Baker's daughter, bake some bread. Oh, all right, said the baker's daughter, remembering her father's words. She found a smaller lump of dough, rolled it, threw it in a tin and slammed it into the oven. She looked in through the window and, just like before, the bread began to rise immediately into a fine, crusty loaf. And even though this piece of dough was smaller, the loaf was even bigger. There was also a spicy smell of cinnamon in the air. The baker's daughter was astounded. <laughs> this is especially too good for the likes of that old woman, she declared. And even though she knew the old woman must have heard her, she lied again, saying she had burnt the bread and put it aside to sell the following morning. Then she told the old woman to go. But the old woman did not go. She stretched out her claw-like hand and, pointing her bony finger, said, Baker's daughter, baker's daughter, doesn't do the thing she ought to. I am hungry, must be fed. Baker's daughter, bake some bread. The baker's daughter had had enough. You stupid old woman! Who do you think you are ordering me about in this way? The old woman said nothing. The baker's daughter glared at her and in the shadowy glow from the oven, that was the only light in the room, she thought how much like a hawk the old woman looked with her long pointy nose and wizened claw-like hand. She also thought about supper and how she wished she was at home, not stuck here in the bakery with this stupid, stubborn old hawk of a woman. Then she remembered her father's warning. Resentfully and with an impatient groan, she turned back and grabbed an even smaller lump of dough, rolled it, threw it in a tin and slammed it into the oven. The bread rose immediately and the shop filled with the smell of baking bread and it was even better than before because this time there was the smell of cinnamon in the air mixed with spices and candied orange peel and honey. The baker's daughter opened the oven and looked in. She could hardly believe her eyes. This loaf was so big, it filled up the whole of the inside. Much, much too good for the likes of that old woman, she proclaimed. In fact, I think I might have some for breakfast. 
That'll be lovely toasted with a bit of butter. Mmm. She carefully lifted it out and placed the enormous loaf on the counter. It smelled so delightful that her mouth began to water. She leant forward and breathed in the sweet spices as they rose from the hot, sticky loaf. How delicious this loaf would be, eaten hot straight from the oven, she thought. She licked her lips. Suddenly, she felt so hungry that she could not resist ripping the end off and stuffing it into her mouth. She chewed ravenously. She had never tasted anything so magnificent in her life. Greedily, she grabbed some more of the loaf and stuffed it in, savouring all the wonderful flavours, and as she did, she thought how clever she had been to make something so delicious. But what had she done differently to normal? She stopped chewing for a moment as a thought struck her. She looked up. The old woman was still standing there, She had forgotten about her. The old woman looked different now. She was standing straight and tall with her arm outstretched, pointing towards the bread and her eyes were blank as if she were in a trance. The baker's daughter felt a shiver down her spine and the pleasure and enjoyment she had felt moments before now turned into fear and uncertainty. Who was this old woman, she thought. The baker's daughter took a step back and said, Who? 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 But she found she could say nothing more. She swallowed the bread she was chewing in one gulp. And as she did, her throat felt tickly. But when she put her hand to it, she was shocked to find it was covered in feathers. Who? 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 she said again. She put her hand over her mouth. But instead of a mouth, she found she had a beak. The baker's daughter felt frozen with terror. As she stood there unable to move, her eyes became round as saucers and her face flat and wide. Who? 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 she cried more desperately now. Suddenly, A great gust of wind blew open the door. The wind whipped around the room. It took away all the delicious smells of the bread that had been hanging in the air and filled it instead with the smell of the earth and the damp from the wood. She felt the wind blow across her arms and could do nothing but watch in horror as they covered themselves in feathers. As her arms changed into wings... She could feel herself shrinking. She was no longer tall and thin, but small and round, and instead of feet, she saw she had the talons of a bird. The baker's daughter opened her wings and took flight. As she did, she saw she had been turned into an owl. Furiously but silently, she brought her powerful claws up to her face, ready to attack. She dived towards the old woman, but just before she could strike, the raggedy old cloak the old woman had been holding so tightly began to unfold, revealing itself to be a magnificent pair of feathery wings. They lifted her into the air, and she flew over the baker's daughter and around the room. Who? 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 screeched the baker's daughter as she stopped and turned in midair. The old woman suddenly seemed beautiful and strange all at once as she circled above her, but the baker's daughter was in no mood to be made a fool of in this way. Having caught her breath, she turned in an instant and flew frantically upwards, ready to attack, but the old woman vanished and the baker's daughter caught nothing but empty air. Who? she desperately cried. Turning, she flew out through the bakery door into the starry dark night to look for the old woman. And all that remained in the bakery was the half-eaten loaf 
and a few soft feathers settling softly on the ground as the door quietly closed. The next morning, when the baker awoke, he was saddened to find his daughter had not returned. He truly hoped she would have been capable of this one act of kindness. When he entered his shop and found the two large loaves ready for sale under the counter, as well as a half-eaten one on top, his heart filled with joy. Maybe she had fed the old woman after all. But why had she not come home? Every day after, the baker hoped his daughter would return. But she never did. He would have lived out the rest of his life a lonely man, had it not been for an owl that began to follow him home each evening, gliding between the trees and watching over him through the night. Or so it seemed. To this day, the baker's daughter still flies around Amport Woods looking for the old woman who changed her. And it is said, if you hear an owl flying through these woods saying, Hoo! Hoo hoo! It may very well be the baker's daughter looking for a way to lift the spell. Well, that was a great story. And I think the moral is, you should always be kind and respectful to people. Now, versions of this story have been around since before Shakespeare was alive. And we know this because in his play Hamlet, the character Ophelia says, They say the owl was a baker's daughter. Lord, we know what we are, but know not what we may be. So I suppose Shakespeare must have listened to this story as well, and he must have liked it to include a reference to it in one of his plays. Nowadays, we think of owls as being kind and wise, but in Shakespearean times that wasn't the case at all, and there have always been lots of superstitions surrounding them, maybe because they fly and hunt at night, and maybe because they have evolved their flying feathers to limit noise when they flap their wings, so they are eerily silent when they fly. I think they're fascinating, and I was really interested to find out more about them and about some of these superstitions. Luckily, we have the world-famous Hawk Conservancy up the road, in Amport, where the Baker's Daughter story is set. So, I went along to have a chat with Tom Morath who is the fundraising events manager and part of the bird team there. He is a fountain of knowledge about birds of prey and was the perfect person for a chat about owls. He also brought a surprising guest with him. So here I am at the Hawk Conservancy with Tom Morath. And Tom, well... Tom, shall I let you introduce yourself? What do you do here at the Hawk Conservancy? Yeah, well, I am a very, very lucky person because it's my job to, or part of my job, to look after all of the different birds that we've got living here, um, which is about 130 different types of birds of prey. Wow. Um, including uh, quite a few owl species, actually, that we uh, that call the Hawk Conservancy Trust yeah, home. Yeah, and talking of owls, I, I, you've got a little friend with you oh, today. Oh, you noticed that, did yes, you? Yes, I, I can hear him. <laughs> yes. uh, so would you mind introducing your, your friend, which everybody can probably hear? Of course. Um, this is Troy. Hello, Troy. Troy is a tawny owl, so-called because of the lovely plumage that they've got, this lovely kind of brown coloration. They've got all these beautiful kind of cream colours all over. They've got black barring down on their tail as well. Um, yeah, they're really actually a beautiful species of owl. You see, as I, I, I'm looking at him here, he is absolutely adorable. He's got that classic flat face with those huge, huge eyes. And he's very, he's very vocal. He's, he's very chatty today. So why is he making all these noises? Is that... So Troy has a bit of an interesting story here, really. So, oh, right, OK. Um, he actually, most of the birds that live here are captive bred birds of prey. So they've come either, they've been bred here at the Trust, they hatched here, and we've looked after them since they were babies, yeah. or they've come from other zoological collections. Troy's a bit different in that he actually originally came from the wild, and he was picked up and he was brought here to kind of hopefully be rehabilitated and put back in the wild. Sadly, the people that had found him and picked him up left it a bit too long before bringing him into us at the trust. 
owls grow up really quickly and they imprint uh, on whoever it is they see feeding them. So if you feed a baby owl for too long, just a matter of a couple of weeks, they will think that they are part of your family. So for Troy, he doesn't think that he is lovely, beautiful, brown, fluffy, tawny (laughs) owl. He either thinks that we're all owls as well or he's a tiny human being in an owl costume. Oh, Troy! So that call that he's making... He's basically saying, feed me, don't forget about me, because he thinks that we all here that work at the Trust are his mum and dad all rolled into one. So he wouldn't be able to be put back in the wild, then he'd Yeah, sadly he can't. He relies on human beings um, to be fed, and he has attempted to catch his own food, even in this this beautiful woodland arena here. It's It's very natural for him to be flying in this sort of environment. Um, And his favourite thing to try and hunt and catch is leaves and twigs, so not going to sustain him for very long at all, is it? So... We've talked about him being in, imprinted on you, and he was very poorly when mm. he was first found. And l- he, luckily enough, he was brought here. But the reason he was able to stay here was because you have the resources to be able to look after him. Oh, hello. That's a donkey. That's a donkey. <laughs> We've got Mickey and in the also way. a donkey or two. And they don't fly very well at all. <laughs> very, very well. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. So apart from donkeys, you have the National Bird of Prey Hospital we here, do. haven't you? Yes. And well, what happens? Do people can people bring animals here or birds here? Yes. So it's only birds of prey. So we specialise in uh, rehabilitating and, and looking after injured or sick birds of prey, and sometimes orphaned birds of prey as well. So that's the case with our number one patient in the hospital are the tawny owls, just like Troy. Um, and that's because tawny owls fledge much too young in, in many cases. They do something called branching. So it literally is hopping out of the nest site and jumping around the branches in the tree yeah. surrounding that nest site. And then very often they lose their footing and they <gasps> fall down to the ground. Now, luckily, baby tawny owls bounce really well. That big kind of fluffy coating they have <laughs> is really good for cushion that fall. And, and most of them will survive completely unharmed by that. Right. But... I think sometimes we as human beings, we want to help, and that's lovely, and it's lovely that people want to try and help these, um, what people believe are these abandoned or injured orphan tawny owls. Most of our advice to people is if if you find a baby tawny owl, is to leave it where it is, because mum and dad will still come in and feed it, and the young tawny owls at the time they're branching, they've got really strong feet, and they'll use their beak like a climbing hook, they'll actually climb back up into the nest site. Of course, people are worried about them. You're absolutely right. They can bring them here to National Bird of Prey Hospital. We treat over 200 patients every year. Anything from, you know, tawny owls like uh, like Troy here, right through to sparrowhawks, goshawks, harriers, eagles, ospreys. You know, they've all been patients here at some point. Right. With the aim, of course, of, of re-releasing them and rehabilitating them to the point they can go back out into the wild. That's the, that's the whole point of the hospital. So he sat there, well... I was going to say looking at me, but he's not. He's looking over there at something, but Mm. his body's facing me and his head's turned right, right round. So is it true that they can't move their eyes? Is that something that I've heard? So an owl's eyes are absolutely huge within their sockets. Right. Um, And that means that there's very little room to fit the muscles that you and I have to move the eyes around within their skull. So instead, evolution has decided to give them the ability to turn their heads much further right Um, and it's not quite 360 degrees otherwise it would fall off probably their head (laughs) would fall off um and it's it's about three quarters of the way 270 degrees (gasps) 270 degrees that's amazing oh he's just done it there he's just turning his head isn't he and this is all because (laughs) of his biology if we were to kind of have a really good close look in at what's underneath all of those feathers and underneath the the skin and the muscle around the neck we'd find that this bird has more vertebrae in his neck than we've got right so we've got seven troy's got 14 bones in his neck wow perfect oh. for a bit of extra flexibility he he heard a noise there yeah turned... we've got uh, what have we got up there we've got a little great tip just up in the tree and uh, they don't like him very much. Any of the wild little tiny birds don't like him in this environment because he's one of their predators. Not that Troy's in any way interested in trying to catch them. So Troy's eyes, very, very big, can mm. turn his head 270 degrees. And, well, we all love owls now, and we think they're very, very wise, mm. don't we? But it's not always been the case. No, it hasn't, actually. We've, we've had a bit of a... A bit of a strange relationship with owls and, and depending on where you go throughout the world 
we've all seemed to have slightly different interpretations of, of whether an owl is a nice animal or not a nice animal in our kind of our own personal mythologies and, and folklore. And you're absolutely right. Nowadays, pretty much everybody loves owls. We do. And they're quite fashionable, aren't they? You see them on, you know, scatter cushions and curtains yep. and jewellery and all sorts of things. I've got we a just lovely owl love... necklace. Of course you have, yeah, <laughs> because they are just wonderful animals. But you're quite right, that hasn't always been the case. So the baker's daughter story um, dates back to Shakespearean times. And from what I know, well, owls kind of had a bit of a reputation for being sort of ghoulish and, yes. and, and frightening. I'm, and I'm wondering, well, what, why is that? Well, there's probably one particular owl to blame for that, and yeah. that's what, during those days, might have been called the ghost owl uh-huh. or the screech owl, which wouldn't have been a, an owl like Troy. It would have been what we know today as the barn owl. Now, oh, yep. if anybody's familiar with a barn now, they will know that they are mostly pure white in colour. And if you kind of cast your mind back to kind of Shakespearean days where people might have been perhaps a little bit more superstitious, and if you're wandering around a, uh, an old church or an old abandoned building at night, perhaps you've come out of the pub, a bit bleary-eyed, worse for wear, and you look over to the old churchyard, and what should you see but a pure white figure hovering over a grave in the darkness and the Mm. only sound it makes it's totally silent except for a blood-curdling screech Mm. now that to me is a firm foundation of a good ghost story so people are actually frightened of owls and in particular of barn owls and so quite often they they weren't very kind to them in how people wrote about them how people thought about them and in fact some of the actions that people took against owls people would hunt them catch them and try to try to kill them so yeah not always had a good relationship with owls at all so when did this change, or how did this change? Do we, is there any reason for it changing, or is it just because we got more familiar with them? Yeah, I guess we got a bit more of an understanding of what these birds were, um, and as we kind of relied perhaps a little bit more on uh, modern-day science, I guess we understood these birds for how wonderful and how graceful they are. But in different parts of the world, they're actually quite the opposite. They were, they were revered as being very, very good luck. So in some parts, if you heard a a screeching owl, that was a blessing to a newly born child, for example. Whereas, you know, back in the day in the UK, if you heard that when your child was being born, bad, bad news for you. (laughs) So it really depends where you are. I suppose as the world's opened up, we kind of, we sort of accept other different cultures Mm, and what other people think. For sure. I mean, you said about the owl being really wise. We think that came from ancient Greece with the, the Greek goddess Athena, she was always depicted with a little owl on her shoulder. And in fact, even today, a little owl's scientific name, the first bit is Athene, after the Greek goddess Athena, the goddess of wisdom. So that's all that time ago, people had a real respect for owls, just in a different part of the world. Because some owls can actually be tiny, can't they? I've yes. seen some here, actually, which are quite small, but there's ones, I think, are they the elf owl? Or, yeah, elf which owl. Are really tiny. Certainly one of, if not the smallest species of owl, worldwide and um, we have a pearl spotted owlet here she weighs about 60 grams can you believe <laughs> whereas troy here um he's about just over 200 grams so this is actually our largest species of owl in the uk he's making a lot of noise at the moment and we've talked about the fact that he thinks that you're his mum mm. now in my story the owl makes a particular noise and mm. i go hoo 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 and I think that's for the purpose of the story, obviously. Right. <laughs> and we do hear that noise, mm. but owls don't always make that particular noise, do they? They make lots and lots of different kinds yeah. of noises. There's a big range of noises that owls make, and it can actually make them quite difficult to identify. But across the world, you can expect to hear anything from screeches to cackles to chirps, cheeps, hoots, lots of different sounds. And even you can hear Troy here. Troy is actually the only owl in the whole world, the only species of owl in the whole world, that actually does go to it to woo. So there's over 230 different species, only one goes to it to woo. And he's not doing that at the moment because he's asking for food and attention, just like a young owl would in the wild. Um, But in the evenings, when we've all gone home, my colleagues that live here on site, they know, we hear Troy going to it to woo, just like his wild counterparts do. And uh, so to it to woo or hooting... Usually in the UK, if you hear that, it's a, it's a tawny owl. So if we were in the woods at night and we saw, or we heard even, an owl go, hoo, 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 so that, could that be somebody like Troy? Definitely, yeah. And in fact, if you hear two hoots, or usually if you hear to it and to woo, that's actually two owls talking to one another. So, oh. so you could actually be stood in the middle of, of a, an owl courtship if you hear both of those sounds together. Oh, how lovely. 
I'm wondering, do you know whether the baker's daughter ever got bought here, maybe as an owl? Is it possible to tell? Do you know? Well, I, I often wonder that myself. Really? Because we're so, so close to it, aren't we? You and we are, certainly very, see very lots of uh, wild owls out and about in the local countryside. So who knows? The baker's daughter could be one of the birds that Cedric and the team have rehabilitated and yeah. looked after and is now uh, living happy and wild out in the surrounding <laughs> countryside of Amport. <laughs> it could be. So if anybody ever wanted to come here to um, visit the baker's daughter to see if she really is here mm. or flying about, how, how do they come to um, the Hawk Conservancy? What do they do? Well, at the moment, um, just head on to our website, so yep. hawkconservancy.org, and you can uh, book your tickets to come and see us here. We've got three daily flying demonstrations, so 130 birds for, to come and, come and see. And, uh, yeah, lots of very exciting things happening every Brilliant. day. So if okay. you like wildlife and you like nature, it's a great, great place to come and have a day out. Fantastic. All right, well, thank you so much. Thanks for having You're me. Welcome. And thanks for bringing Troy out with you. I'm just going to say, should we have the last word from Troy? Definitely. <coughs> <laughs> Bye, Troy. <coughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> Well, that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed the tale and the facts behind it as much as I enjoyed discovering them and writing the story. Thank you for listening. Test Valley Tales is an Arts Council-funded project and part of Test Valley Arts Foundation Borough of Culture Legacy Projects. You can find all sorts of project resources on my website at wwwmerry go roundstorytellingcouk forward slash test valley tales there is a downloadable map with postcodes to find all the story locations links to walks and craft activities you can also buy the test valley tales illustrated book of short stories there test valley tales is on instagram facebook and twitter as at test valley tales and this podcast can be found on podbean at podbean.com forward slash test valley tales if you are interested in finding out about other types of storytelling i get up to or you would like to book me for an event you can email me at mgrstorytelling at gmail.com i am on facebook instagram and twitter as at mgr storytelling and merry go round storytelling on youtube I also have another storytelling podcast which can be found at podbean.com forward slash funny tales and fairy tales. And all this information can be found on my website, which is wwwmerry go roundstorytellingcouk Happy storytelling, and I look forward to telling you another tale soon.